to the sermon. I want to share this with you uh, that I wrote for the upcoming newsletter. Um, and this has to do with what Barbara and a few others have told me about the movie Thrive. How many have seen the movie Thrive? Okay, uh, two of you. Thrive. Like you're thriving, you're, you're out there, you're exercising, you're eating well, you're thriving in life. Yes, I did watch it. And so I'm going to read you uh, to the question, do you recommend the movie Thrive? This is my answer. I could go on and on, but I'm trying to make this rather short where you get the point. Here's the answer. Do I recommend the movie Thrive? Yes, with some hesitation. The movie is not Christian or biblically motivated or directed in the slightest. However, I do think mature Bible students should watch this movie because you can use this as a tool to help awaken others. Thrive does a good job of exposing principal er areas of the New World Order, especially with regard to the criminal banking system, the pharmaceutical dynasty, GMO, genetically modified organism, and surprisingly, it does expose many of the main players within the Illuminati. The solution they present, though, are mostly New Age and humanistic in the manner of, quote, can't we just all get along, love one another, and be good socialists? You will have to watch the movie to uh, understand what I'm talking about there, but when you, especially at the end of it, you will see the socialist aspect of what I'm talking about. This movie totally ignores the corruption of sodomy, race mixing, adultery, fornication, idolatry, or any biblical direction or reasoning. If this movie would have addressed these issues from a biblical perspective for the advancement of the kingdom of God, then we would have something to really unite around Pastor Barley. Now, obviously, there's more I could have said, but I'm giving people a short answer to the question, should we, um, by the way, could you uh, put that on my desk? I need that. Um, don't want to lose that. Um, the movie is about two hours and 12 minutes long, and it is, uh, it is worth watching. It's powerful. Uh, I say the things I said in what I just read because I know the mindset of some of the people, some of you people possibly, that because it didn't address this issue or didn't address that issue or it wasn't totally Christian, then I don't want to watch it. Well, uh, there's a lot of things we watch and see and observe that are not, quote, totally Christian. Um, this is a surprise because for a humanistic approach, and it is humanistic approach, it exposes a tremendous amount of truth in uh, this movie. I don't care who you are out there, uh, even if you know the Bible, and well, this will be an education for many of you. And uh, that's why I do recommend it, but you have to be very careful in it and what you're accepting uh, in, in watching this movie. I do that with all things. I, I question, I don't just sit there and just soak it in and believe everything I'm, I'm hearing or watching. You guys don't do that, do you? I didn't think so. What I felt most uh, important about watching that movie is in that how well it was done. Yes, it was very well done. They spared no expense. Right. Fantastic way, in a fantastic way. It's all, I mean, you talk about 90% of truth, but there's yeah. no God in it at all. You right. Like, oh, my goodness. Yeah, they're missing out. And by, by the way, in what you, like you said, there's no God, and I have. Jew part, the Jew part where you say. Yes, there, there's, a, there, there's a Jew part in there, and it even shows Jews and the banking. I mean, seriously. And then they move away from that and do what Griffin has always done, and all these other guys, some of the Birch Society type. Now, we're not anti-Semitic, and don't read in this anything that might be anti-Semitic. And you're watching this, is obviously exposing the Jews and the corruption of the Jews. The very thing that they're talking about in it, they, they succumb to it. 
Yes, yeah, absolutely. Exactly. They are very, the very thing they're railing against about being anti-Semitic. Yeah. Um, they, another thing about it is that, just real quick here, is, is um, the Bible, when I was watching this, and, and of course they're giving humanistic, especially at the end, solutions to it. First of all, every one of the problems that they describe in this movie, the Bible addresses. Every one of them. And the Bible has biblical solutions, but they wouldn't dare explore. They could have had a large segment on biblical solutions to how we can deal with this. And that we already have a large group of people called Christians. Christians, why don't we unite together? Why don't we come together? If we Christians alone will pull their resources together, come together in unison, uh, support and seeking the kingdom of God and using the, what the Word of God tells us, applying the biblical principles and solutions that are there, we could over, more than easily overcome this system and correct it and have a utopia upon this earth. But that's what I'm saying, only through Christ. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The other, the other thing, I, and I've got to be moving here. Sorry, I can't spend a lot of time on that. Uh, I just want to share this. Somebody sent this to me on Rick Stevens. Rick Stevens is a guy that's on these public shows, public, uh, uh, brought, uh, public uh, supported yeah. media or, uh, channel. And this is Rick Stevens Europe. If you all have ever watched these publicly, yeah, he is on there a lot of times. And uh, apparently he's done something on Israel, uh, and this is called Reflections on Israel and Palestine. Um, it, it says, I've been duped. Do you know the frustrations you feel when you believe in something strongly, when you realize that the information that made you believe was from a source with an agenda, you, to, w with an agenda to deceive? I just watched a powerful, courageous documentary called Peace, Propaganda, and the Promised Land. It certainly has its own agenda and doesn't present a balanced coverage. Still, it showed me how my understanding of the struggles in the Middle East have been skewed by most of our mainstream media. Duh, I add. I saw how coverage of the Israeli-Palestinian problem is brilliantly controlled and shaped. I pride myself in understanding how the media works, and I find I've been bamboozled. Invest 75 minutes in watching this because most of the time we only hear one viewpoint when it comes to the inter, uh, interminable struggle in the Holy Land, while this documentary would never been shown on commercial TV in the USA, it can be viewed online. Again, that's peace, propaganda, and the promised land. In my view, many Palestinians still uh, uh, live under inhumane conditions, and the U.S. taxpayer uh, helped to make it happen. That's, an, that's important. They're using our tax dollars to make this happen. Please watch this and then share your impressions. Uh, there are a lot of comments. One of the comments is, I think almost everyone in the United States would agree that there are two, maybe three sides to every story. Rick's advocating that we watch a video is nice, but how about we just think about uh, perceptions on the average American? The U.S. citizen sympathetic to Israeli causes are pronounced and evidenced by groups such as APAC, A-I-P-A-C, individuals like Shel uh, Sheldon Adelson, A-D-E-L-S-O-N in Las Vegas. He's that guy that's uh, uh, spent tens of millions on people like Gendridge supporting him. He's a Jew, remember? Sent sen all that money to Gendridge. People like Wolfenwitz and Perlman got us into a war in Iraq. The settlements by Israelis on is Israel's borders have disregarded its neighbors. The other side of the coin is that Israel has been attacked 
relentlessly for decades to the point where it hawks wants to protect it at all costs, but the birth rate in Palestine is many times that of Israel, and in 30 years or less, Israel will, uh, will be an apartheid country if it does not antecede to its two-state solution. And it goes on with other comments about the Palestinian victims that are very interesting. I like this. Stir up the controversy. Get people thinking, though. That's my point. And uh, so truth is coming out in lots of different areas and lots of different ways. All right. So with that, let us uh, move on to the message today. Again, that will be part 16 of Declaring the Israel Truth. Uh, we might quit, quit when we get to 300. Part 299, no. Just let me know when you're bored with this. We'll move on to something else. How's that? Um, I really most sincerely believe, as I've told you before, that this is an important topic in lots of different ways. I believe if you really understand the Israel message, if it is really true, and it is, then we ought to be thinking about it a whole lot more than what we are. Now, most Christians today, actually we'll say Judeo-Christians, because that's who they are, that think this way, they think what? They believe that the Jews, of course, are God's called out covenant people. Uh, I saw on the uh, TV this morning while I was getting dressed for church, I put on the old Hagee guy to see what he's up to. And he was over in Israeli Palestine doing a sermon from the Mount of Olives there. And he was using the, the Israel message to basically say again that if we don't support the Jews, God's going to curse us type of a concept. And I'm like, how many times can he keep saying that lie over and over and the people don't wake up to the lie that he's telling them? He is telling them a lie. How can he get away with saying a lie over and over like he is? Unless, unless the people have been deceived to love to have it so. There has to be something in the theological uh, indoctrination, that process that has taken place in their lives whereby they believe that, hey, if we don't support the Jews, if we don't praise the Jews, if we don't bless the Jews, if we don't have a blind eye to whatever they do, I mean, treat them as though they walk on water and God will bless us type of a mentality. How can they develop that type of a mentality? How can they develop that type of a mindset unless they have absolutely been lied to and deceived by false shepherds? And that's what's happened. They've been lied to and deceived by false shepherds. Now, you may say, somebody said, well, I know a lot of godly ministers out there that teach this truth and they're not false shepherds. Well, let me put it to you this way. If I tell you a lie, and maybe I'm doing it ignorantly, and I'm preaching that lie to you over and over and over throughout the years, am I still a false shepherd or am I still a false shepherd? I'm still a false shepherd. And that's what's happening. Now, when we look at what the prophecies and the declarations that are given to us in the Word of God concerning Israel, uh, then then we need to put that to the, and use that as our litmus test. Give the people the opportunity to actually hear what the Word of God teaches and what the Word of God says concerning Israel, and then let's, let's see what happens. Let's see if people start coming under conviction. Let's see if they start asking questions. When, pe when Christians start asking questions, when they start thinking outside the box, that's when we're going to see real progress. Are we seeing that at this time? No. I like to ask the question, what would happen if Iran did get the bomb 
and Iraq did use it against the Jews, against the land is of Israeli Palestine, and they blew it off the map. Some people are listening to what I just said. God forbid, and that's why we need to bomb Iran right now. Let's go bomb them and kill them before they kill the Jews. Well, what a lovely thought, isn't it? Oh, we don't, they pride themselves. We don't discriminate. We love everybody. Oh, do you really? Do you love the I, people of Iran? Well, we love the people of Iran, but we don't like the leaders. Well, then why don't you just go take them out? Like uh, your, a lot of these people will praise Obama for doing with uh, uh, Os Osama bin Laden. Just go take out the bad leaders then, right? Well, of course, that's not really what they're thinking, though, are they? They're not. They're thinking, yes, we've got to go bomb Iran. We've got to blow them off the map before they use their bomb. What a lovely thought again. But they pride themselves again in being, oh, we're, we're Judeo-Christians. We're the most loving people on the planet. We, you know, oh, you really are. Uh, what about if somebody doesn't accept Jesus Christ as their Savior and they're born in Africa and they're not given a chance to know the Lord Jesus and they're 21 years old and they die? Well, I'm sorry. They're of the age of accountability. They're going to burn in hell forever and ever and ever. Billions and billions and billions and trillions and trillions of years later, they're begging, they're crying out to Jesus. I didn't know. I, I, you know, Jesus, save me from this hell. Save me from this torment. Sorry, I'm not even going to hear your prayers. Oh, but we worship a loving Savior. Thank you, praise you, Jesus. Do you just understand the confusion here? Do you understand they're loving? But they will come along to somebody like me and say, Oh, you're a hate monger, right? Because you don't believe the Jews are God's chosen people. No, I believe that we are the true Israelites. I believe that we reflect and we have the uh, marks of true Israel upon us. Even in our sin, and even when our God's judging us today, the marks of Israel are upon us. Just look at Deuteronomy 28. If you'll do this, Israel, I'll bless you. If you'll do this, though, I will curse you, Israel. You'll have the type of president over you, like you have today, who can look at Obama and not say, golly, we are being cursed because this idiot. And of course, I'll be the first to say, we're being cur uh, we were cursed when we had Bush. Bush Jr. and B Bush Sr. And some people will not like this at all, but I even believe strongly, most strongly, equally strongly, that we're cursed under Reagan. I don't think he was the walking Christian great light that they portray him to be. He sold out our nation in many ways as well. How many of you remember back when uh, he was president, the, the one of the many stinks that was going on at that time, is that Nancy Reagan and them were having seances at the White House. How many of you remember that? Oh, what a great Christian thing that is. But we could go on down the line. Don't you understand that he capitulated with the bankers as well? He was one of the puppets of the bankers as well. And if you're thinking that, wow, if we just follow his policy and that alone, we're going to be so blessed today. Well, maybe we'll be better off than what under Obama. I would, uh, I would agree with that. But it, all it is is progressivism. Reagan was progressively worse than the other presidents in many ways. They just keep getting progressively worse. But, oh, Romney. Romney's our great hope. If we can just get Romney in there as president, it'll all, it'll all get better. No, it wouldn't have gotten better under McCain either if McCain would have been elected president. As a matter of fact, I truly believe this because I lived in Arizona. I know what kind of a scoundrel and warmonger and corrupt individual John, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, John McCain is. If he would have become president of the United States, I fear him actually more than Obama. Because, I mean, I didn't bring all the, the areas which he sold our nation out, but he has. And he would not have been good for our nation as well. I don't believe that uh, unless a president repents, unless he openly declares his Christian faith and operates on Christian principles, 
we are not going to have a change in our nation. We're going to continue down the slippery slope to uh, just like we are into being cursed, and we will continue to be cursed as long as we d deny God's word. I mean, what, do you expect anything different, folks? Do you expect any, if, if, if whoever's going to be president, if they deny God's word, God says what? I'm going to bring these curses upon you. Wouldn't you expect, therefore, God Almighty to do that? Well, I would. So I'm not really surprised by it. <clears throat> well, we've got to have an attitude change in a lot of different areas, right? There's no doubt about it. We've got an attitude change, and uh, we've got to have faith. And we need, to, we need to really strive to seek that faith. And that's the only way we're going to have peace which patch, which pass this all understanding. If we continue to dwell on uh, the problem without understanding the solution and without really having a, a, a deep understanding of the kingdom of God, and we are not seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness the way the scriptures tell us to do it, then we're not going to have peace. Now, um, our nation's in trouble on a lot of different levels today. And as long as we continue down this slippery path, we're going to continue to have problems. That's just a fact. But knowing your identity, I think, can help give you peace of mind. Some, person, some people may think, well, I don't think it's giving me peace of mind because all I understand is, the, is these troublemakers and these imposters that are in power, and we're not. Well, if you look at it with that slant... I guess you won't get better. I guess you will be dis discouraged and uh, not encouraged in the slightest. You've got to have a blessed attitude. You've got to develop a blessed way of thinking. Does that make sense to you? Do you kind of understand what I'm saying there? Even hearing it, doesn't that sound good? To have a blessed way of thinking? When we develop a blessed way of thinking, meaning we set things in their right order and we have the right biblical priorities, it'll help a lot. Today, again, a lot of people are looking at the problem. What is looking at the problem going to do to you? It's going to get you depressed. Obviously, it's going to get you depressed. But think about this. If we look at the solution and we really look at uh, understanding that Jesus Christ is the way, he is the truth, and he is the light, he is the life that we are to have, there can be a major transformation there. I still remember back when I became a, quote, born-again Christian. I'm not going to get into the definitions of that and all the ramifications of what it means to be born again. But I had an understanding at that time, though limited, of what being born again meant. Now, obviously, I was a much younger individual, but I did it in faith. And I went down and gave my life over to Jesus. Now, I might add at that time, I'd already done it over eight times. But at this time, there was something different in my life. I really... I really caught on to the understanding that, wow, Jesus really is very God. That, that he is truth. He is the ultimate truth. And I don't know much. I'm just an ignorant young man. But I believe now that Jesus, if I turn to you and I look to you as the author and the finisher of my faith, that I'm going to be blessed. I'm going to become a born-again Christian. I'm going to develop Christ-like thinking, Christ-like manners, Christ-like attitude. I want to be a walking example as much as I possibly can of you, Jesus. I want to be a light into this world. I actually had that understanding at that time. Now, when you develop that, when I developed that at that time, things, the whole world became different to me at that time. And it never has changed. It's only gotten 
deeper and deeper and deeper. But I would submit to you that you have to go through that type of a life-changing process, spiritual transformation. Now, I don't need a show of hands, but I just want to ask the question, and you think about it. Does that make sense to you? Because if that doesn't make sense to you, then forgive me, but I have to question whether you're a Christian. So again, some people probably are listening to me right now, watching this saying, well, am I really a Christian? Well, it's a good question to ask, I would say. If Jesus, not, is not, if Jesus Christ is not the reason, and He is not the Lord of your life, oh, I've heard that in the Judeo-Christian world. I don't like that. Everything, that, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, friend. Well, he's my Yahweh of my life. Okay, if you want to play that game, go ahead. He's the Yahweh of your life. But he's Lord of our lives. Let him be the Lord. Let him be very God of our lives to direct our way, our thinking, our attitude. Let him be our motivation for whatever we're going to do. Does that make sense to you? Amen. Thank you. Thank you. I really do appreciate that. Because now we're getting to the heart of the matter, aren't we? Now we're getting to the very heart of the matter. And so blessings took over my life. Everything changed at that point on. Everything. I mean, I would like to go back and tell you all the somewhat bad things that I was into at that time. But I'm not going to. I'll let you fill it in with your life. And you go back and think, wow, I remember way back when. And boy, pastor only knew that. Hey, we're not up here to compare sins. It's not a big thing. We're all sin to fall short of the glory of God. I'm sure, in my mind, you're all about, much more evil than I ever could have thought to be. I'm sure of that. <laughs> <laughs> Having fun here. Uh, but um, I developed a, a, an attitude of blessing, and I moved out of cursing, because I was actually living and following and abiding in the solution. I didn't have great wealth. I've never had great wealth, as a matter of fact, but I'm fine with that. I, I'm okay, I'm comfortable today, but actually most of my life I've lived it means that people would think, wow, I don't even know how you did it. A lot of my life, I've simply lived on faith. And it's sometimes at the very last minute, help comes knocking at the door, and, and I'm, I'm okay. Thank God for that. But, uh, um, you know, I could take you back to the time that Martha and I were married. You know, I'm working a part-time at United Parcel Service, going to the University of Texas there in San Antonio, and we had to live in a very substandard gov sub government-subsidized housing or we wouldn't be able to live at all. And we drove around in old, old, old cars. And we just didn't live extravagantly. We, you know, we just couldn't. And uh, when we got into Phoenix there, guess where we lived when we moved Years, uh, sometime later into Phoenix. And actually, one of our neighbors down the road was Steve and Jones and Darla. I mean, a lot of people are not aware of that. I've known Steve since 1976. I've known him a long time. And they lived in this government housing sector because we couldn't afford anywhere else to live either. So we were living in the government housing. And we had, oh, you know, druggies in the area. And we had this, and we had that. You can just imagine, you know. And I didn't like it. It wasn't comfortable. I, we had to do all, God help us, God protect us, and God protect our children and all. But we made it, you know. Um, the point is, though, I am so happy I'm a Christian, in short. I'm so happy and blessed that I'm a Christian, I wouldn't change it for anything. So we need to develop in short, a blessed attitude. And we are, since I'm on the subject, we are most blessed for being Israel. Oh, that is just so cruel. That is insensitive to the other races. I cannot believe you said that, Pastor. Um, why? 
Shouldn't we thank God for God's word? What, if Whatever God's word is, it is truth. And it is a truth that will set us free, and ye shall be free indeed. Why are we so bound up today as a people, as a nation? One of the main reasons is we really do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, the true Lord Jesus Christ. Number two is we don't know His law. Number three is we don't know who we are. If we understood who we were, would we not as a people, as a nation, be operating on a much different level? Our values would be totally different. Thank God for that. Our values would be totally different. Wouldn't you like to have change, blessed, biblical values today? Wouldn't, we, wouldn't you love it for our government? Whenever they were going to do something, you knew they are going to operate on biblical principles. And you didn't have to worry about how they're going to steal a lie and deceive us. I will say this about that movie Thrive. Thank God for the movie Thrive showing what these New World Order elites are doing to us. And they literally have an agenda, which I've told people about for years and years, a population reduction. And this thing of what, what's going on in our economy today, economy today, where they're stealing our homes, they're stealing our property, they're, they're taking away our heritage they're destroying us as a people and as a nation in so many ways, it would have boggled your mind. And by the way, some people want to hear this again, God's letting them do it. Or if you don't want it like that, God, Yahweh's letting them do it. Jesus Christ is letting them do it for a reason. Now, I can walk around all despondent about that and discouraged about that, or I can say, hey, hallelujah. Why would I say hallelujah? Because he's in charge. He has a plan. Now, if I, if I live and work or I'm concentrating on the cursed, and those that want to curse us and what they're doing, I'm not ignorant of that. But I want to, I want to be an overcomer. And I'm going to overcome their cursed thinking and their cursed uh, process with truth that will stomp them down with the blessed process and the blessed thinking. In other words, I can live outside of their cursed world. I can li live outside of their cursed thinking that is on me today, and I can be set free and walk in freedom and liberty with pennies in my pocket, maybe. Well, I always see you do that. Sometimes I look at you, Pastor, you look a little down or discouraged. Hey, I'm human. I get down. I don't know anybody that doesn't. But I do my best to fight and overcome that by not dwelling on that and not living in that cursed world. There is a cursed world thinking process, again, that is destroying us and seeking to destroy us And I don't care what those so-and-sos are doing to us today. I want to dwell on what he's doing. If you get anything else out of the sermon today, get that. But also they're keeping us down because they want to keep us biblically ignorant of who we are and our heritage. And I tell you right now, I don't apologize. I do not apologize in the slightest for loving my heritage and wanting the best for my heritage and wanting the best for Israel. And, 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 and having Israel love and support and worship the cursed area and the cursed peoples in a, in a way because they're cursing us. And calling themselves Judeo-Christians, that's destroying us. God help us. God deliver us from that mentality. God deliver Hagee from that mentality. God deliver Beck from that mentality. I'm hearing Beck. My wife puts them on all the time. I won't listen to them. No, I, I put them on every day. I, I hear him every time I hear him. Like every time I hear Hagee, it's all praise the Jews. And if we'll support the Jews and, and, and blah, blah, blah concerning the Jews. It's like calling Mitt Romney a Christian. <laughs> like Christian, yeah. Well, um, listen, folks. 
Here's how important it is. You could say, well, you know, it's just so controversial, this issue of who Israel is, and I'd just rather leave it out, and let's just dwell on all the other things. You will never walk in the mind of Christ with that attitude because it is a major part of the mind of Christ. Are you listening, people? You will never have, develop, or walk in the mind of Christ. And you're either going to have the cursed way of looking at this or the blessed way or the truth. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You have to make up your mind who the true called out and chosen people are. Are we being blessed by worshiping the Jews today or are we being cursed? You know, it really is that simple. And I think it would be most helpful for us to have some scripture verses to look at at this time. I want us to first turn to Psalms 147. And verse 19. Here, Psalms 147, verse 19. He showeth his word unto Jacob, his statutes and his judgments unto Israel. He hath not dealt so with any nation, and as for his judgments, they have not known them. Praise ye the Lord! You may think, well, you said, you said praise ye the Lord. No, you're not reading the scriptures. Look at it. Am I... Am I taking something away or adding to the scriptures? What did it say again? He says, I, I've shown my word unto Jacob, my statutes and my judgments unto Israel. He had not dealt so with any nation. As for its judgments, they have not known them. Who? The other nations. The other people. They've not known them. Oh no, I can go to Africa and there's lots of evidence of that. Where? Until the white man and white civilization came there, there was no God's law. There was no light, truth. There was paganism. There was savagery. I'm going to get into some of the things on their, their way of life, how they lived. For thousands and thousands and thousands of years, they have lived as savages. Oh, you're saying that to insult them. I'm just saying it's a fact. But look on in this verse. It says this. They have not known them Praise you, the Lord. You don't like that? We'll take it up with Jesus. Because that's what the Word says. But that ought to mean, praise ye the Lord. Hey, we're Israel. He has shown us His laws. He has given us His laws. But what have we done with them? Praise ye the Lord. That people like George Washington... And John Adams, and we could go on and on, our founding forefathers of the nation, though they didn't walk on water, they were imperfected, imperfect in many ways. I'll take their imperfections over the, what we've got today as our congressmen and our leaders in any day, in any way. They read the Word. They read the Bible. And they gave us many biblical principles that we have today. And our nation is standing because they stood on God's Word. They gave us biblical truth and biblical principles to help build that Christian foundation in our nation. And Benjamin Franklin says, we've given you a republic if you can keep it. They also said, it's wholly inadequate for any other people but a Christian people. And we have not maintained being a Christian people because we've had liars. False shepherds coming into our land deceiving us, leading us away from the truth. And look at us today. Duh, I wonder what's happened. Okay, let's look at, uh, let's go to, gosh, you know, there's many verses on this. Many verses, I'm telling you right now, folks, there's some tremendous ones. You can go to Amos, you know, of all the families of the earth, I've only known you, Israel. Let's go to Romans uh, chapter 15, lack of time. Romans 15 and uh, verse 8.
Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. What did Jesus do? Now this is what it said Jesus did, right? Not adding, not subtracting. To confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Well, what are we trying to do, most Judeo-Christians today? Unconfirm them. Now, if you're trying to confirm the promises unto the Jews as God's chosen people, and they are not confirmed unto them, are you going to have problems there? Well, are we having problems again in conferring what God Almighty has not conferred upon them? Guess what you're actually doing to yourselves, people, and as a nation? We are cursing ourselves by doing that, doing something and teaching something that is totally contrary to God's word. Come on, wake up. What we need to do, therefore, is confirm, like Jesus did, the promises made unto the fathers. Does that make sense to you? It ought to. It ought to make strong, apparent, biblical sense. Got a problem somewhere there, do we not? Is this Israel truth important? Declaring the Israel truth. This is what the Word tells me to do. Confirm the promises made unto the fathers. By golly, I'm going to do it. And by golly, I'm going to be proud of that in a biblical way. Not, not, not so much racial pride. Racial pride is okay as long as it's done according to the Scriptures. And that's hopefully what I'm doing here. I'm not doing it just for racial pride in and unto, and unto itself. That would be wrong. But we're doing it declaring the promises of God. And standing on the promises, whether the majority does or not. Again, I have a problem with people that make decisions according to what the majority is doing. And you know, that's what most of the Judeo-Christian world does. They cannot handle the truth. We've had people that have left our movement because they cannot handle, well, it's not a real big movement. There aren't a lot of people there. And I'm going to go over here to this other church over here where there's lots of activities, lots of this and lots of that. If that's your reason for going, you are nothing but a worldly, misplaced, misguided individual. I'm not even going to call you a Christian. I can't even call you a Christian. You, that, that's, is that being Christian? That's what the world does, is it not? That's what people, that's what most of Washington, D.C. District of Criminals does. That's the way they live. And, you know, they're quite proud of it. I think I, saw, I heard a statistic the other day on, on uh, that like 30-something percent are supporting Obama. 38% uh, or something like that. And you know who most of those 38% are besides the blacks? I'm not saying all of them, but most of them, let's face it, are. And a lot of them are telling us today that, oh, no, I'm not, I'm not going to just support Obama. Uh, uh, I'm going to wait and see. I think you're liars. I think when it really comes down to it, they're going to vote according to race, most of them. But anyway, 38% of them, you look at Washington, D.C. Now, Martha and I were there a year or so ago. It was a thrive. It's thriving. People were telling us all over. I mean, when they put up their house, it sold just like that almost. Why would their house sell so quickly in Washington, D.C. area? It's because that's where they're keeping the money, and that's where all... And we... <clears throat> government's growing. It's a government growth industry over there. They're taking care of their own. Even in the black sections, the black people in Washington, D.C. are thriving like they never had before. We went, when we were there, I got lost got into the black section of town. I went for miles and miles, and I had been through that section before, and it was run down. But this time, every block, every street, every restaurant, every business was being remodeled on the outside. They're putting new roads in, new lights, changing the whole area up with government tax dollars to what? To placate and pacify these people. 
Why are 38% of the, uh, who are those 38% supporting Obama? Those people that love socialism. Okay, uh, 1 Peter 2.9. Okay, here we go. 1 Peter 2, verse 9. Oh, we've heard this many times. That's a good one, though, to use here. But ye, somebody here, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who's... Who's being called out of darkness into his marvelous light? Who are these chosen generation? Who did God choose and call to be his covenant people? Well, you see, Pastor, it's all people, and Israel's done away with. It's all spiritual Israel. And if you just love Jesus and you accept him as your Savior, you're a spiritual Israelite. And that's who Jesus is calling right here. He's calling all people that are Christians. No. No. No, I know that sounds good. I believed it for many, many years. But when you go back and you look at the scripture after scripture after scripture from the Abrahamic covenant, when God Almighty called Abraham and told him, I'm going I'm to make this covenant with you and with your descendants, and you're going to be a light into the world, a light into the nations. That light has only come from, though it may sound racist again, from only one people, and that's Israel. And we believe they are the Anglo-Saxon, Scandinavian, Germanic, and kindred people. I don't want to hear race. All you're into is race, Pastor. That is, that is just so unchristian. Ooh, I don't like it. Well, how about if I said it was a Jew? Oh, ooh. Come on, really, that's how it is. That's really how it is. You hypocrite, you. Wake up. Now listen. We're, okay, you, you're just, you, it's so racist to you. Take the white people out of the picture. What kind of a world are you going to have? Oh, there's that racism again. I don't like it. I don't care if you like it or not. Take them out of the picture. We're gone. What kind of a world are you going to have? Think about what kind of a world you're going to have. Oh, you're just puffing up the race here. No, I'm puffing up what God Almighty has said. Listen to me. I'm puffing up the word of God. I'm puffing up what he has declared. You know as well as I do, Judeo-Christian, that if I was puffing up the Jews, you would be singing and dancing. I'll tell you the truth right now. As a, this, move, this, this church wouldn't have any financial problems if I was singing the praises of the Jews because that indoctrination and lie has been so indoctrinated into the people that they think that if they send a check in support of the Jews, God's going to bless them. And they're looking at the wrong kind of blessing. Well, I have sad news as far as I'm concerned. Maybe some of you watch as good news. i got to close right now. My time is up. But I'll tell you right now, folks. I don't know why God Almighty led me to do this series starting out, but I say thank God, and I don't even care if 1% of the people out there are listening to me. I'll take it. Praise God for that. But I think... And I really believe more than 1% are listening. And I'm talking about even of our own people. I think a lot of them have gone to sleep. A lot of you have gone to sleep out there. Don't tell me you haven't. I know you have. You've gone to sleep spiritually. You've heard some minister spiritualize Israel or this and that. You haven't heard maybe a teachings on this in a while, so you've gone to sleep. Or you, well, I guess maybe it's not important. I haven't heard anything or read anything on it or whatever you're doing. I don't know what you're doing, but I'm telling you right now, it is just as important now as when Jesus, our Lord and Savior Yahweh, gave those covenants to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's just as vitally important today as it was back then. Don't you ever let that truth slide away. Don't you ever let it get away from you. Always honor this biblical truth and the covenants that God's made, and you'll be on the right side, and you will be blessed. Let's all stand. We'll close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we love you. We appreciate you. We appreciate this Israel truth. 
and we pray that it will go out and get in the hearts and minds of as many people as they can possibly, uh, however you want it done, Jesus. We just want you to do it. Open the doors where they need to be opened. And we know a lot of doors are being closed today. And we know that we're in darkness, and, but that the day is going to come when the floodgates of darkness are going to be closed and the floodgates of light and truth are going to be ushered in. May your truth prevail, and quickly we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen and amen.